I'll just give a quick um, intro talk and then we'll go over to Anna. So now, um, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Computer Arts Society talk on AI and the arts. Now, this talk is based around the launch of the second edition of the AI Creative Writing and Arts Anthology. And we've got four artists from the book talking about their art and AI tonight, which is really exciting. So I'll keep the intro fairly brief and then we'll move on to the, the talent, basically. So um, now the AI Creative Anthology first edition came out a year ago, it was March, I think, last year. And that had 20 writers using AI tools, and most of them had never really worked with them before. But um, it was quite an interesting project. And in that section of, uh, in that first edition, there was some discussion of their methods as well, which I think we're going to get tonight from the artists. Uh, so the second edition came out today. It's free, has it's pro probably about 30 odd or even 40 artists in it. Not everybody has contributed new material, but there's a lot of uh um, pieces on art. It's like Damien Hurst is in there with the currency, for instance, because that uses machine learning. And Tom Cruise is in it, which I added right at the end because he's a big deep fake uh, recipient. So there was a big piece about mm. that I thought was quite interesting, given that vid text to video is in the news now. Um, in the book, I've put some images from my generative art piece, uh, Pattern City, which was in the CAS, Computer Art Society, um, exhibition last year so I put a little bit of my own work in um, that piece hasn't been exhibited anywhere yet but it will be hopefully this year uh, it's on for everybody who's new to the group now it's on jeffdavis.org website which is my spelling of my name g-e-o-f-f-d-a-v-i-s.org uh, o-r-g it's the ebook or pdf format it's going to be on there for a while and then eventually go on to all the digital channels in a few weeks time again free um, okay, there's a little bit about my AI, AI research I do at U University of the Arts London in there as well, just for anybody who's curious. Okay, so now then, quick run through what's happened in the last year, which I'll keep really brief. Um, there's been some huge improvements in the various AI tools and some new ones like text to video or at least new ones to the sort of public. Um, and the, the simple text generators have got to GPT-4, which is very advanced. Uh, there's all sorts of new generators out. Now, the this week, there were two big announcements. One is OpenAI brought out um, Sora, which is spelled S-O-R-A, which is a really, really good text-to-video yeah. generator, which does HD and widescreen, so things look cinematic. Um, it creates about a minute of video at a time, apparently. And it's not out to the public yet, but it's uh, if you go and have a look at OpenAI website, the main site has got it on the front page the other one was um google released gemini 1.5 which has a really big context window which is how much um text you can shove into it at a time and that's huge now and that's that's another big change in uh how people will work with these tools so that's two big things happen this week uh there's so much happening that it's pointless trying to predict too much what's going to happen and um uh, so I won't. I just leave it with that for the, for the, for the comment on what's sort of happened over the year because it's the last week. There's been these two big announcements. Um, I will talk about the U.S. writers' strike in a minute, though. Now on the art front, because this is a to talk about arts after all. Um, the big thing really is that AI arts got into the normal art scene or marketplace. I mean, Refik Anadol, who's a fairly lo long term. AI artist had a really big show at moment. You know that honey never spoils? Archaeologists have found pots of honey in ancient Egyptian. Hey, I've got a... Oh, thank you. Slight thing came in there. Um, he had this huge show. It's still on, I think. He's big show. Uh, he processed all the artworks from the gallery, made an enormous video piece after that with dramatic music, huge crowds. People sit there watching it for ages. Um, it's bought, the piece was bought by the museum and put in their collection. So people are taking it very seriously now. Um, I mean, that piece of work, I don't find particularly incredible. It's just the usual blobs whizzing about, but perhaps size matters in galleries because these spectacular things work really well in big spaces. And that's quite important for galleries. Uh, in the NFT market, there's been a you know, drop in prices. You know, NFT, you know, crypto is obviously cycling anyway, cyclic sort of market. But there's also a big oversupply of AI and generative art. 
AI art can be produced by, you know, anyone nowadays. It's not a difficult thing to do like it used to be. And um, all computer classes teach generative art because it's a fun way to learn coding. So there's a lot of people producing things now. So in a way, there's it's supply and demand. Um, there's still, you know, a shortage of good art, I'd say, but, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, and this is very different from the old days uh, when it was you know, hard to do things and there wasn't an audience and it was really a sort of practitioner's playground. Um, now it's the opposite, the big audience and a lot of people doing it. And that's very healthy, whether the prices are up or down. It's still good that there's a lot of people involved in it now. Uh, I just mentioned Hockney was using digital, uh, uh, did digital work in the 80s. I mean, that shows how long it's been around before it's got to the, this point of being quite public. He was working on Quantal in the 80s. Um, now, the other thing that happened this year was the writers' strike in America, with the Writers Guild of America went on strike for 148 days, finished, uh, they settled it in September. And um, there was the usual stuff about wages and benefits and whatnot, but AI was a big part of the, uh, the worry that they'd become obsolete as writers and that AI would do all the creative work. So in the memorandum of agreement from September, they agreed, you know, the bosses and the workers agreed that AI can't write or rewrite material. This is script material, but, you know, it sort of applies outside a bit, I think. AI can't be used as source material for a film. Existing material can't be used to train AI. So they're sort of covering all, all the different areas. And also, quite interesting, AI can't be considered a writer because it does not produce literary material. Now... This is interesting because if you look at that overall, if AI can't produce literary material, then you can't talk about co-creation anymore because it's only a tool. And this is where the the professional writers who, who make their money are very worried. So they're trying to avoid the AI having a credit. So if if the if the uh, you know the producer said, okay, well AI wrote twenty five percent of this, we're only going to pay you seventy five percent. Obviously, you know, they control the AI or it's the public tool. So that's that's a good point, I think. Um, so that's an interest. I think if you have a look at that Writers Guild agreement, it's quite an interesting one if you apply that to other professional areas. Because um, once you start talking about co-creation, then you're losing control as an artist anyway. So you don't want to do that, even though it was, I mean, I thought it was quite a good term for a while, hybrid, co-created, all that, but... It's not really because it's the always the artist that does the work. I mean, the computer. I mean, it, the computer can produce things on its own, but it has to be started off and designed to do that. So that's interesting, coming from a sort of professional writers' um, union, basically. Uh, okay, now that's about it for my intro. Uh, now this evening we have four artists talking about their work. First is Anna Maria Caballero, who will read City Life, I believe and talk about how all this came about. So that's really interesting. Then um, we're trying to keep the talks to about 10 minutes or so, so we don't run out of time. Uh, Anna's followed by Patrick Lichty, uh, James Bloom, and then uh, Johnny Dean. So they'll all introduce themselves and go through what they're going to do when they, they do their talks. So hopefully we'll have some sort of discussion at the end with some questions. So if you want to make a note of any questions, you know, people in the audience or other, you know, other artists you want to make notes about what you want to talk about, we can discuss at the end. There's no actual hard end to this meeting. I think you can just go on if it, there's an interesting discussion going. OK, so I'm going to hand over to Anna now. I hope this all works. Soon find out. Hello. Are we, are we handing, have we handed off? You have to um, share your screen now. Yes, I will. Um, I'd like to speak for a minute and then I'll share the screen and read. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Ana Maria Caballero and I am a Colombian writer. I've been living in the U.S. for quite some time and I'm currently based in Madrid, um, Spain. I am a poet and artist um, who best describes actually my practice as a literary artist because I incorporate classic literature also into my artistic practice. I am also very much a traditional writer. I've published five books. I have a sixth book coming out in May. Um, I also write for, for Forbes and for other publications. And um, all this to say that I'm very, very much familiar with um, 
traditional literary practices and the establishment, and a big believer in Web3 and the opportunities that it can afford writers. Um, and as soon as I heard about Web3, I immediately dove in, really seeking um, to figure out how to activate poetry by enabling ways to not only transact it, but to exhibit it, to participate, which for me is a very, very important word in the art market as equals, um, as poets. And as part of this, this mission that I have is um, was the creation of a gallery called The Verse Verse, which um, I will write it here in case people want to check it out. Um, oh, can I put it in the chat? There we go. Okay, sorry. Um, so that's the um, that's the literary gallery, and um, it seeks to onboard poets and pair them with digital artists so that we can introduce the work of some of today's top writers. We have Guggenheim Fellows, we have Pulitzer Prize finalists, National Endowment of the Arts winners, really, really top, top poets who've been working for you know their entire lives um, have fortunately joined um, the Verse Verse and we've been lucky to exhibit their work um, together with many partners in, in many venues across the world. And we continue that work um, to this day. And as part of the, the mission that we have at the Verse Verse, um, we also engage with technology very, very directly. And we have a series called Gendext, which is short for generative text. And um, this series pairs a poet, uh, an artist, and an AI, some form of AI writing tool to create collaborative works. Um, of course, when we were just getting started, um, it was pretty much the founders creating works um, and putting them on the verse first while we got people sort of more excited about it. Johnny, who will be speaking later on, was also one of our first uh, poets to join, fortunately. Um, but the, the series that I'm going to share today is actually from our gen text um, let's say section within the verse verse. And I worked with an artist who also uses AI in her practice. Her name is Ivona Tao. Um, and she's quite well known within the, the generative art world. And I would say beyond as really just one of the most precise and I would say rigorous AI artists working today. Um, and we co-created this work um, I actually sketched it out during the funeral of a very, very close friend's father. Um, my father having, having been ill, he passed recently, but having been ill for many, many years. And so I, I kind of felt like I was mourning my father via my friend's father. And um, as soon as I wrote it, Yvonne and I had been speaking about collaborating and I knew it was a perfect piece for Ivona's work because it's you'll see it when, when I share some of the stills, it's very moody, very shadowy, um, just very blue, very, very like the corners of, our, of her blue heart, she says. Um, and in working with AI, I used a tool called Pseudorite. They were an early partner in the verse verse. Um, and it's a, it's a great tool where you can um, tell, I mean, this was, you know, Two years ago when we started, um, Chat GPT hadn't come out. It was this was all very, very um, you know, avant-garde then. And I guess outside of certain circles continues to be, right? Um, but you could obviously tell that, that you wanted to create a poem. And it was my first time writing with AI because I am a pen and paper writer. And my experience was that of working with a very, very talkative and friendly thesaurus who um kind of spoke back more than maybe I even wanted to. And I had this strange feeling of, of feeling like I wanted to be doing the writing. So it got me going. Um, it was an engine for my creative practice, as well as suggesting and opening doors um, that I would not have, um, would not have um, used. Of course, that happens as well with this thesaurus, but this was just turbocharged. This was like the entire, you know, vision of the poem before me. Um, and I think it's also really useful as, as a traditional writer to see where I don't want to go. Um, so, you know, not only is it, okay, writing, like my experience was not, oh, this is writing for me. It was more suggestive and 
I was seeing the direction I didn't want my writing to take. Um, so now I'll share my screen. I'll, I'll share some of Pavona's beautiful, beautiful works. Um, there's a video version of this of this poem um, that we created with voice um, and some music, and it's it's right now actually at the Wrocław. I'm mispronouncing it, but it's at a contemporary art museum in Poland, um, the Wrocław Contemporary Art Museum, and it's exhibited there until May. In case anybody happens to to stop by, um, the video version is is currently um, being shared there. And um, so we created 12 stanzas, 12 visual stanzas, because my poem had 12 stanzas and each stanza is paired with one of her stills. And I had the, the work of, of pairing my, my writing with the visual, which was a really rewarding experience. Um, so I'll, I'll read the poem now. And I unfortunately cannot stay till the end. I, I have children and I'm alone with them and um, I need to put them to bed. But if there are any questions, if you put them in the chat, I'll try to answer them quickly without taking any more of, of anyone's time. Um, and I'll leave this still on while I read. Um, Jeff, I don't know if, if you have any comments or suggestions at this point of my intervention. Um, always happy. I think you're muted. I think you're muted. The um, moving video version is also very good. I mean, that's the piece I should say to the audience that uh, the stills, it should be moving, but with this, uh, in this forum, it's going to be a still. You see yeah. what I'm saying? So if you, if you put the link to the video in the messaging at some point. Well, I mean, I, I kind of wanted to um, read the poem and then if you want... Yeah, no, can... reading it is great. I'm just saying that there's also a video yeah. that people want to I'll see. I'll link it. I'll definitely link it. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I definitely, um, I'm looking forward to the reading. Don't worry. Okay. okay. That's great. Thank you. City Life. In the city with blunt edges, life comes forth against the crafted rock of sidewalks. Our feet forget black dirt. Water light, concrete and time, elements that we compress and compact. Cranes of metal cut the sky, then a solitary pigeon flies by. I am here to sing, I state, but the day swings back and I fall hard. I grieve amongst the infrastructure, columns and footers underpin my call. You were here once in this built metropolis with us. You loved to swim, your body bronzed by my son. Do I cry for you? Or do I cry for every father? For mine? For all my high-heeled asphalt walking, I remain a daughter, a fruit who at its core is summed up as seed. In the funeral mass, I hold the thin wafer, memory of a father, on my tongue before I swallow. Bread breaks within me, becomes me, but I remain hungry. After the ceremony, bodies form a single row. We wait for a moment to embrace the bereaved. A faint breeze blows, stirs frail leaves, while beneath the red tiled ground, soft dirt sustains my feet. World of tree, world of cut stone, place of passing through, land of soundless bone. I take one step forward within the breath held line. It is always, almost, my turn to mourn. Thank you for listening. I should say there was a lot of construction at the church going on at that time. Um, so that 
probably gives it better context. And I will um, share the video, which is online. Yeah, that, that was excellent. Thank you. It's an honor to hear it because I've read it many times, you know, looked at it and so hear you reading it is great. So thank you very much. Is there any, any uh, um, anything you need to say more now before we move on? Um, no, okay. I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry to delay you if you've got kids to think about. Excellent. Um, okay, so uh, do you have a, couple, a minute or two now for any questions from people? If you're going to be not around later. Yes, I do. I do. I have I have a few I have a minutes um to okay. so maybe if anybody has a question, just uh make yourself known, or maybe not. I just ask if you are you doing any more work with Iv Ivona or video work in general? Um no, actually, um, you know, I, I feel like these collaborations are usually it's it's like a it's like a child, um, you know, maybe one is enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, this one has, has had quite a quite a life, I think, beyond sort of the moment of of presenting it and transacting it. It's it's continued to you know, to find sort of venues to show. So that, that makes it very fulfilling. I mean, it's really, she went to go visit it in Poland. She was nearby and she sent me pictures and yeah, it's just continued to live, I would say. So you'd prefer to stay as a, a an oral poet? Um, Me? Yeah, you know, reading and doing live events. And so. I mean, I, I I do that very much, and I enjoy that very much. Um, but but sure, there's other there's other dimensions too. Yeah, um, sure. I see that somebody's asking about the verse first, the tokens. Um, what forms the tokens take? Is that do you mean what blockchain they're on? I'm not quite sure. I understand the question. Are there MP4s? Are they JPEGs? Are they Right. Yeah, that the latter, the latter. Like I see a lot of images, so they're the JPEG or some image format. And then I'm wondering is it just sort of open or yeah, like you know, videos or text piece. So um so we have a lot of stills, but a lot of videos as as you can tell, there's a lot of sound. We we really encourage poets to incorporate voice. Um we think that's really, really powerful to have the capacity to listen to a living poet deliver a poem the way they intended it to be received and so there's a lot of poems with voice but sometimes nfts um act as certificates of ownership we also have several physical works um where the nft is is really acting as a certificate of ownership and it you know the artwork lives in the world in a different way Okay, um, are we ready to move on? Any last questions? Ah, one new message, hang on. Oh yeah, people are praising, you're getting some praise in the comments, that's good. Okay. Okay, everyone, are we ready to move, Anna? Is that okay? There's, a, there's another hand up too. That was a great answer though, thank you. Okay. But yeah, there's uh, another that, one. Yeah, that's me. Um, uh, the, the piece we just heard, Anna, I presume it was created uh, in the English language, and I wondered if you'd worked uh, with AI in any other um, natural languages. Sorry, I don't know if, why I couldn't find the, the video. I just found it. I'm um, sorry. Um, yes, I work with Spanish as well. Um, I grew up in Bogota, in Colombia, and um, I work with AI in Spanish. And actually, one of my projects involves inputting raw text from um, Jorge Luis Borges. Um, and Margarita Guerrero, his collaborator on a particular work called The Book of Imaginary Beings, in putting it both in Spanish, the raw, raw text, and then the raw translation in English, um, and comparing how the how the text is read by the artificial intelligence. Um, and it's really it's really interesting to see the different the difference in 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 how it's interpreted. Thank you. Thank you all. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, okay, great. 
linked a copy of the poem that you can download if, if anyone wants. I mean, it's, you know, it's it's obviously a very Web3 to replicate the file, but the ownership is certified elsewhere. Um, so I'll, I'll send a link to the poem that can be downloaded. Um, and thank you all for having me. And I really apologize for not being able to stay all the way through the end and hearing everyone else. No, we're very, we're very glad you could come along. It's excellent. And don't worry about leaving a bit early. That's fine. Thanks for coming. And thanks for... Good night. Good night. Thanks Congratulations. For Congratulations. Good luck, Johnny and James. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Okay, now we go on to Patrick, okay. who's ready and raring to go, I hope. So I yeah, think yeah, to yeah. share screen and then you take over the show. Is that right? Okay, I need to be able to do screen sharing. It's on the bottom of my one on a more button. What's that? On the on the screen, you sh you should have the oh hang on. Let me just Let's see here. Uh, no, it's host disabled uh, share a uh, screen sharing. No, I've just yeah. I've changed you to a host now. So okay. you should now be able to um turn yourself into you know the host and share your screen and do all that. Oh stuff. brilliant. Okay, great. So here we go. Is that all right? Okay. Yep, I think we're good. All right. I great. think I'm gonna run this live. I have a recorded version, but uh, I think we'll just go ahead and do this live since I've run through it a few times. Okay. So let's see here. Let's get going. Um so this is a little bit different. I'm working in a, some some different methodologies, and um, some of this is older than current. Um, so I hope this is kind of interesting. Oh, my name is Patrick Quickie, and oh, um, let's see here. It's my presentation. Okay. Um, so let's see. Let's see here. Can you hear this well enough? Uh, I can only hear you. I can't hear any video voice. Okay, you mean like, all right, well, let's see here. All right, well, this is my presentation, fiction uh, fiction from the future, Alaskan dome punk, faulty memories and artificial hallucinations. So um, what is so, in the, what is in piece that's uh, part of what's uh, in the book is, um, um, this, let's see here, is a um, piece called Beta Test. Uh, and it comes from a climate fiction story originally, uh, this all of these uh, pieces that I'm going to talk about come from um, something called the archive, which is um, based in a um, in a uh, um, 22nd century future in which dome cities around the world are uh, being uh, created to hold the remainders of humanity and its knowledge um, until the world heals. Um, and um, let's see here. And so um, so what this is, this is part of a larger um, project that uh, um, I worked with, with uh, uh, Nathan Schaefer in Alaska. Um, basically, he was doing these um, projects on um, uh, failed uh, mega projects uh, in, uh, in Anchorage that he was finding in the um, uh, Alaska archive and doing uh, augmented reality of it. And, um, you know, we were thinking, like, let's let's do some uh, literary projects in it. And so um, he got together a lot of uh, indigenous folks, and uh, um, basically we did, um, you know, a lot of um, a lot of um, um, illustrated um, uh, illustrated stories. And uh, I wrote this piece called the uh, archive. Um, basically, had to do with finding these uh, unfulfilled mega projects near Anchorage um, in uh, the, um, you know, uh, and um, Bruce Sterling's uh, call for more 22nd century uh, fiction, and also the 20, um, let's see here, the uh, mid 2010s of emergence of climate fiction, climate fiction. So to me, I think this is really kind of um, a form of reflection of uh, zeitgeist phenomenology under kind of this set of stories. In other words, because of the fact that the, the shape and methodology of each of these stories and the way and the way it emerged really has to do a lot with uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the moment in time, uh, the methods um, available um, and, um, and um, you know, just kind of way and the context in which they emerge. So, um, you know, they really kind of reflected the digital culture and technologies for the moment. Um, the, um, the archive itself um, is really just, um, you know, it's, um, 
It's a story in which climate change created the necessity for create, uh, creation of great archive domes where people would seek refuge during the healing of the climate, where humanity's knowledge would be woven on huge living tapestries in the uh, large rotundas in the uh, deep in the uh, deep in the bottom of the uh, in the archives. Um, the larger scenario uh, for this was um, the opening of the multiverse uh, through these um, um, researchers uh, doing uh, research at the uh, HARP um, ionization uh, facility, um, high energy um, Aurora high ionization facility in, um, in Gakona, Alaska, which is kind of a conspiracy theory site. So um, from this, you know, I created uh, a number of other projects. Uh, a lot, I have about five or six stories that are currently um, un unrealized, but the ones that are realized, a book called New Memory Rescue and the story, which is in Jeff's uh, anthology called Beta Test. So the proliferation from all of this, Nathan would also go on to create uh, a cap creative capital funded uh, Anglo indigenous comic book company called Fishhead Soup, which would create numerous volumes from, uh, you know, uh, in his associated Wintermoot series, um, among others like Chickaloonies and so on, uh, basically um, kind of an indigenous superhero, um, you know, a graphic novel series, which uh, I'm, I'm really glad to have, um, you know, seen happen. Um, so new memory rescue, let's get into some of the work, uh, where, you know, this, let's go into the, um, arc new memory rescue actually was created in 2018. Uh, it's a shared universe abstract novel based on, uh, failed human memory downloads, um, for use in the tapestry based archives. So it, uh, was, um, inspired by the, uh, errors inherent in transcribing interviews I'd done for Harper's Bazaar Art Arabia um with nuance dragon dictate now this brings forth a question so um the sources i used were mainly uh interviews i'd done with uh turner prize uh, winner tony craig and slavs and tatars when they showed at uh was it at, at third line uh, slavs and tatars and then um um oh let's see here i'm trying to think um um I can't remember the gallery in, uh, in, in Dubai, but um, anyway, um, what happened is uh, this, is that the scrambled fragmentary nature of the transcriptions seemed like bad memory downloads. So I took these uh, erroneous transcriptions and I framed them with a chapter describing the, this protagonist that I usually uh, use, uh, Susie Beaufort, who's, a, uh, who's an archivist and her uh, cognitive extraction exercises. So as such, the chapters were not really coherent, although I edited them enough to work in an abstractive narrative from the art archive uh, storyline. So the resulting book was uh, published by uh, Wrong Biennial Director David Guillaume's abstract uh, edition series. And it isn't really coherent, but it has kind of a flexus like lyricism that I enjoyed. Here's, I'll, I'll do a couple of sentences. So lastly, is it that step 11 calcified drops me even if it notice in the evening, we were like the beach or in the forest or something. Uh, everything goes on, has a fantastic form about the whole thing anyway. Um, I believe Forsyth is uh, treating all the fees from the family just perfect. That the site is right, so everything we buy for the file on your skin is very, 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 very tight, very, very precise. There's no holes. No doubt we'll be concealing many weeks. So one question I have is speech recognition, the artificial intelligence of 2016, uh, because that's when I did this uh, decoding. So on to beta test. So for this project, I created this using uh, chat GPT-2 while it was still around. Uh, I created another uh, Susie Beaufort story, this time in testing a new multiversal access interface that was kind of in beta. Uh, the idea was that since accessing other universes was incredibly fraught, you know, it, 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 this was a new interface that would open communications. But in my story arc, this would also lead eventually to the multiverse wars because you don't want to open all the universes to one another. The idea was that the seed narrative would be set while chat GPT-2 would continue to generate the story. 
So while the seed of the story created a consistent narrative towards the beginning, it seemed that as I kept going on, the generated further generations created further divergence. So, um, and these are actually, just as aside from methodology, these are um, mid-journey five, six renders of, of parts of the text. So, um, so the thing is, what I thought was interesting is that as things went on, uh, GPT-2 started hallucinating. And so while the seed of the story created this consistent narrative towards the beginning, it seemed as time went on, generating further text, you know, created further divergent. At the end, it endlessly wrote, you can't be the raven, you're a clamper. And just kept writing this, you can't be the raven, you're a clam you're just a clamper. And the thing is, is that that was nonsense, that was totally nonsensical. And but I couldn't go any further with it because that was, you know, kind of the state that it wound up in. It wound up in this cyclical state. So basically what I wound up doing is that I wound up writing another little uh, section that uh, kind of wrapped things up, contextualized things, basically said that uh, this multiversal bubble kind of collapsed, but uh, instead of it being either a cognitive dissonance or a hyperspatial di dissonance, you know, I kind of left a, a additional little glass of wine sitting there that wasn't there before bringing in a wonder, you know, bringing a little bit of wonder whether this was something that was, you know, something uh, that was spatially consistent between different universes or not. So um, I have some questions is that qualitatively speaking, what feels more creative, you know, dealing with a glitch or watching an L a large language model glitch out? And the thing is, is it really necessary to write conceptual frames for AI generated text to give it some sort of context in itself? Um, is there something that, you know, we're deluding ourselves with and considering that we're being creative as Nora was talking about this idea of co-authorship. And then what does it mean when one curates and regenerates uh, like taking GPT text and then using it for prompts, generating music and so on, or like I've been doing and taking, you know, these uh, generations and using, uh, using it to create these, um, these um, pictures. And then the other thing is, is that is this creative or is it some sort of fluxus uh, process dream cycle? Like I have this Godzilla image here that uh, just kind of popped out of nowhere. Um, so anyway, I want to thank you. And by the way, I think this, uh, this is interesting because it's a rendering of Patrick, quote, Patrick Lichty in Midjourney 6.0. And I think this is a brutal rendering of my identity. So I'm just going to leave it at that. So anyway, thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Patrick. That was great. Very interesting. I'm not sure that last image was a door, a doorway. So it's quite exciting, isn't it? Or is it, it looks like a concrete kind of slab at the same time. So we are, right? Yeah. Anybody Great. questions? Anybody else? So I think this is kind of interesting in that I'm using some methods that aren't necessarily strictly, uh, you know, the current LLM kind of methods. Um, and I kind of wonder, you know, whether these, you know, these different approaches um, you might consider these forms of, um, you know, artificial intelligence or generativity or algorithm or, um, or so on. Mm. Well, I'd say in the tools are definitely generative or AI generative, but it's what people do with them because they have to be understood by somebody at the end of the day. Uh, yeah. like I've done, I've done a lot of work with the older ones, like, you know, homemade machine learning things and also, chat, you know, GPT, GPT-2 the open source ones, all sorts of primitive ones compared to what's around now. And they are quite creative because they they do go off at tangents and they get stuck, but you can feed it back into itself. Or, I mean, you can also kind of train them on small amounts of your uh, traditionally written text and then just try to con continue. And I've got, you know, sets of things, paragraphs and short things out that follow my style of a particular story and even come up with ideas for it that I wouldn't have thought of. And so I think you can use it as a tool without, um, I think the layering it with the multiverse is quite interesting because that's, that's kind of come from you, hasn't it? Rather than it. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And I think the other thing is, is that I, and I, I like the idea that Brunak is talking about the, you know, if this is a pro kind of flexes like process, why is that creative? Mm -hmm. I think it is. Um, this is, there's another project that I, I did. If you go to my patlichty.com site, um, one called personal taxonomies and, you know, basically I was using GAN based, uh, selection and generation to take about, 
512 uh, abstract calligraphies and try to find commonalities between them and made these um, uh, kind of animated uh, Rorschachs and, and, and all. And so the thing is, is being that, um, you know, there have been, you know, there are conflicting reports about, um, you know, my, uh, um, you know, about uh, um, notions of my cognition, uh, let's just say, is that um, I, I kind of went into this, you know, using all of these, uh, you know, tools to maybe try to find points of commonality and maybe find a kind of like a Noam Chomsky-esque kind of deep grammar um, thumbprint, you know, of all these, of all these pieces. And I, I just sometimes wonder, you know, whether these processes reveal some deep structure about, you know, the, the inherent creative, uh, creative processes within the person's, person using them, or sometimes are we, um, you know, really going on and on with these, you know, these really almost endless, endless processes. And I think sometimes it's like riding a wild, uh, wild Bronco. You have to sometimes, you know, have to steer it and get off the horse at some point and say, okay, well, that was that. Mm. Yeah, I find it more useful for short things than long things, you know, just trying to write a long story is quite difficult with it, I think. But the, with this thing, Gemini 1.5 can hold a gigantic context of, you know, your mm -hmm. more, more tokens than you could imagine. So therefore, you might get more coherence out of it. You see, and that's kind of, I didn't like it so much when it got better. I quite liked it when the system, I mean, they're still around. Right. Obviously, still use them, the old ones. But uh, there was that sort of magical quality of strangeness about them. Yeah, I mean, actually, when I'm doing when I'm when I'm doing um, you know, say for example, when I'm doing things like abstract typography, I love using Midjourney 4.0. I mean, I really mm -hmm. I, I really come to hate 5.0 and 6.0 because it's really you know they're it's really trying to go for this point of veracity. Yeah, and, exactly. Sure. And, you know, and it's boring. Mm -hmm. It's not mysterious. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if nobody else has any questions, I think we should uh, move on because we can have a group discussion yeah. at the end. Is that okay? Anybody, any more questions for Patrick? I think there's uh, a couple of hands up. Yeah, yeah have... ask a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, Patrick. Um, good to see you. Uh, so, yeah, I was just thinking about our, our, the last speaker and, and uh, talking about collaborating and you talking about kind of co-authorship. And um, that, that in, in some ways to me is like a sticking point. And uh, it reminds me mm -hmm. a bit, some years ago I was on a residency at Autodesk and there was an artist there who was um, making sculpture, collaborating with bees. And whenever, mm -hmm. whenever the artist said that, it just made me cringe. And, and it just seemed um, a bit presumptuous. And, you know, I, I don't know. And I have, I have similar concerns about collaborating with machines, with, that, that that notion and and it, I mean it it it's interesting. I, I'm sure it can maybe possibly happen, but I'm I I it 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 becomes a kind of a, it, it's an issue with me, and I'm curious your thoughts on that. Oh, I I, I totally I totally agree. I mean, say for example, as as somebody who has you know a lot of ties to the Fluxus movement and that sort of thing, it's it's to me I I really kind of look at uh, the stuff that's in in the book uh, mainstream main mainframe experimentalism. And uh, you know the uh, the folks in New York, um, you know who were doing you know who were doing permutation studies, you know like uh, Hansen and 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 that sort of thing. It's it's just a matter that, um, you know it's these are you know these are these are procedural tools, and um, they're just extremely complex. So I think um, really any sort of real talk of uh, collaboration is really euphemism. Euphemism, in other words, it's. Uh, you know, we're, we're really dancing with really large apparatuses, you know, at the end of the day. And, um, you know, they're at the end of the day, we, we know that they're, um, and I say this, um, with no disrespect for uh, any of our, um, more better known colleagues, but mechanical Turks, you know, and, um, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of the thing It's at the end of the day, we're either curating or we're hitting the button or we're shaping the, we're, we're shaping the, uh, trajectory. And um, yeah, then that is the reflection of our subjectivity. Wouldn't you think? Okay. Okay. Well, let's um, let's okay. move on to Thank James you. now, because we can take pick up these points later, if that's okay. 
because um, we need to, to keep on the time a bit. So at the end, we can open out this to discussion with everybody. I, just, I, I, um, I apologize. I have a class at two. So that's that's the only oh, thing. You you have a class at two. Yeah, I have a class in seven minutes. Oh, oh, that's a shame. Okay, we'll maybe give you another question then if there's any more questions. Uh, so Eric, how about Eric? Yeah, Eric. You want to talk for me? Yeah, thank you. Hey. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, that was fantastic. Um, I had one kind of short specific question uh -huh. um, about the conspiracy theory, how that fit. I didn't, I didn't, I knew that this was about the mistranslated text. Um, and I didn't know if that early preamble was informing the mistranslated text or if it was just the interviews. And if not, what was that about? And I was just kind of curious, a general question. I'm curious how this is. I want to hear you talk just a, just a bit about how this fits in with your 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 work overall because I love this project and your work has this real chameleon kind of network spreading kind of quality. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of concept humor and this in some ways I, I really see it, but I'm I'm curious kind of how you think about it in that in that evolution. Uh, could could you could you frame that question a little more tightly? Yeah, you 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 and I yeah, ask um, questions the same way. Yeah, right, right. Um, so, could you elaborate on, no, um, I guess, uh, I, I mean, maybe just the, just the, just the, the act of using text and sort of bringing what I see as a kind of experimental conceptual media practice into text and into the sort of literary question. You right. know, I know you're already always looking outside the gallery and looking in, in all kinds of spaces. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just wonder how is this for you? How is that, yeah. you know, in 2018, how is that the, the thing to do within well, I your think, greater practice? I, I think I, I think one thing that I really look at is how media shape our perce perception of uh you know, our media media shape our perception of everything. Um so I think in one way, you know, the 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 dragon dictate, I was I was looking at how, you know, my it was reading my speech as a form of mapping. Um, and then on the other hand, you're know, looking at, um, you know, looking at uh, beta tests as a, another way of how it was taking the, um, you know, the original text and then mapping it forward. Um, you know, it's on one hand, you know, I really get back to this notion of Chomsky of, you know, how these apparatuses, you know, um, lead to perhaps a, a certain commonality, you know, um, you know, for, you know, in, that's consistent with their own methodologies. So it's um, and this is just something that I wonder whether you know I'm I'm finding these things or whether I, I kind of say that we as artists, you know, um, let's see here, uh, chase spectacular concepts or we chase concepts spectacularly, and uh, I'm not sure whether I know um, what the difference is at times, and I think that that's for others to see, and I. Yeah, I hope that it's appreciated. So the 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 conspiracy theory thing, it was really just part of the larger context of the um, you know of of Schaefer's project, and um, you know it's it's really um, not so much of a not you know not not so much of a not so much of a tool. But I, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely, yeah. I love this idea of um, of chasing, of chasing yeah. that to me, um, and it's just sort of like 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 each project is sort of seeking the project that becomes the project that you know that follows and um yeah no i think it's really really great and who knows maybe you can use that that conspiracy stuff for a future thing i think it fits your aesthetic <laughs> it's yeah i mean it's, it's about posing posing and trying to answer your own questions yeah okay great yeah yeah okay i'm, totally. I'm gonna take off thanks yeah, so much I think you need to go is it your students waiting for you now patrick yeah. okay yeah Thanks okay, so much. Thanks a lot, Patrick. That was great. There's a video, don't forget, so you can catch up on the video probably in the next few days today. So uh, uh, the two speakers tonight, we've got James Bloom, who does machine learning and neural net work on with, with network art, I'd call it. I don't know with his James can uh, illuminate us there, but um, working with interactive NFTs that uh, communicate with each other and change their the art that's shown and so on. So that's a really interesting area. And Johnny Dean Mann is the editor of The Tickle, which is an online, very popular online magazine, which is great. 
very uh, very good thing. And uh, he's also a poet and did some visual work recently it's called Slow Gods, which you're going to talk about tonight. So I will now um, move on to James. So hopefully everything will be fine. And uh, I think you've got, uh, you're able to show your slides now, aren't you, James? So we should be able to start. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so yeah, um, so I'm I'm based in London. Um, I've uh, I've had a, a an abstract uh, practice for for over uh, ten years now, and also working with uh, digital media as as part of that. I'm very interested in the meeting point between um, art that uses technology and and also contemporary abstraction as well um i'm just going to post my website link if you want to see um more of my work and then there's my twitter as well if you want to um connect um and i'm i'm kind of concerned with uh i suppose most of my work takes a critical view of technology or engages with it critically from the inside um i for the last few years i've been making as jeff was saying dynamic artworks that um, change according to live data streams. And many of those have been integrated into uh, the blockchain. So for example, a series burner, which is connected to Ethereum activity data, and it presents a kind of continuous stream of changing states. Um, and it, it has something to do with the disappearance of the present moment and um, uh, this idea of, of that we're always kind of set up to, to, to expect something new in our in our, our feed or our experience. Also produced a, um, created a, a series called Gold, which uh, is sort of engages critically with the NFT market. So it's essentially a, a, a series of, of artworks where the, um, it, it tracks all of the collectors of the NFT's behavior. Um, and then any market activity is then reflected back within the frame of the artworks themselves, which kind of begs the question, you know, what what are we looking at here? Is it is it just a kind of speculative instrument or is it is it an artwork or is it, you know, something in between? Um, and I've also, yeah, I've been working with um, with with neural nets for, for a while um, and over the last three years, uh, produced um, a, a series called PFP, which stands for a profile picture, like a social media profile picture. Um, this whole series is about um, is about digital identity, and um, I became very interested in how our uh, our digital identities become um, become splintered in online environments, um, and how. Uh, interacting with people uh in in social media and, and online environments in general one um one is never exactly sure what one's looking at um and so so this is an abstract piece uh, a PF piece in the pfp series um where there is actually a, a a figure in here um you can kind of see there's an eye here there's an, another eye here the curve of the face and then the hair is is down is down here um and uh, the imagery is actually taken from a um, most of my work i kind of start with appropriated images which are taken from the digital environment um this is this is a a, a game um image it's uh, the character is is our niece um uh, from knights of uh, uh, azure and and She's a hero. She's a kind of um, you can see here she's kind of breaking free of these these shackles. Um, she's she's a, one of the heroes in this 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 story. And um, uh, it's quite a dramatic shot um, here. This is a completely different game. This is called Genshin Impact, which is an RPG. Uh, and what I was interested in, in is this idea of, well, if you take a, a character um, and then you use neural nets, to uh, merge that character or place that character into a, a an environment, um, what 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 is the result? And here you can kind of see, um, perhaps you can see a little bit more clearly our niece's face there in the middle, um, that she she has become merged into this this disparate environment, um, 
but her identity has also been sort of slightly subsumed by it. Um, one of the interesting things about using CNN neural nets, which is fairly traditional kind of um, method of doing style transfer, is you can you can bring together images in a very selective way, um, choosing where you're taking that data from. And as the the individual, the character, the personality is is placed into this strange environment, this environment which is is not connected to to the original character um she there is some interference um the neural net through its process of of gradient descent um arrives at a certain conclusion about how to put these images together and yet there are also um there are there are artifacts which are produced as part of that process and this became very interesting to me because as we as individuals enter into digital spaces, our identities do become quite um, ambiguous, I think, and splintered. And it's something that I think that, you know, I'm not entirely negative about. I think there's quite possibly it's just a, 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 a product of our uh, living in these kinds of environments nowadays. Um, but um What's interesting about using the neural net as a um, as a tool in this in this uh, uh, circumstance, and by the way, I don't really refer to it as AI because I think there's so much kind of fetishization of technology, um, and quite often AI is kind of used as a sort of godlike term to kind of conjure up some sort of vision of what the thing is. I think you know machine learning or neural nets is maybe more accurate. It's a tool that's basically processing different images and putting them together or, or, or um, you know, extrapolating them in, in, in some way um, to arrive at a, a conclusion. You notice with a lot of art made with machine learning that there are artifacts, that there are these, these uh, kind of glitches, you know, that it doesn't produce, reproduce reality or it doesn't reproduce its source material in, in, in a particularly ac accurate way. And this was something that really interested me because it seems to me that in our online relationships, this is exactly what happens all the time. There's so much that gets lost between transmission and reception. There's, you know, we present ourselves in ways that, um, that are very, you know, that are ambiguous at times. And so with this series, what I've done is I've allowed the the artifacts to um, to essentially become the kind of material of the artwork itself. So it's the artifacts that really um, that really kind of uh, create the, the the pattern essentially. And that's another thing which is interesting to me about this quite old fashioned now. You know, three years later. Uh, CNNs, you know, hardly even used, um, but they also produce this quite interesting sort of flattening effect, which uh, it does kind of, you know, it takes it back into that kind of world of of abstraction. You get this kind of repetition of pattern and 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 all kinds of sort of shapes and uh, and 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 ambiguous kind of um, forms will emerge as part of this this process. Um, another Piece. So I, I continued this series for quite a while. This is a piece that it's derived from the same original character, but she's um, put in 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 the context of a different scene with different materials um, uh, uh, in that scene. Um, and uh, you can see here that as I'm going further into the series, the um, the artworks are are kind of de degrading uh, more the um the personality or the sorry the character uh is 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 kind of even less visible now but there are there are new features that appear as well for example these clouds or these kind of rocky surfaces that you see um and then of course also the um the artifacts are kind of magnified more as you know as i've kind of continued to to process these images using neural nets as a tool one of the other things that I wanted to do here to kind of um, to to sort of deepen my own um, uh, sort of con conceptual kind of exploration into this 
this stuff into this the, the way that the identity is um merged into this environment and and kind of broken down was to also uh, trace by hand the um the contours that the that the neural net was was producing so here i've just i've done some kind of digital painting afterwards where i've i've gone in and traced and and you know brought out certain details sort of, um to uh i don't know to kind of make it more um vivid uh i suppose for myself um and then uh and then finally more recently last year i did a um a version of the pfp series and this this is two of them alongside each other here um so this this uh, particular piece, which is which is in Jeff's um, book, is um, it's a dynamic version of um, of um, the, uh, the the same character, and here again there's a kind of further degradation or uh, um, and breaking down of of the original. It's sort of progressed progressed if you, if you want to call it that, um, and. Um, but the difference with these is that that they have um, they have dynamic uh, code running behind them. So these these artworks uh, that's why I've kind of put two next to each other is that, is they are they are changing um, as you look at them. Uh, the uh, various aspects of the composition have been kind of separated out as separate elements um, and including different elements from the previous iterations or, or or kind of memories of this this character in in my previous artworks um and um what i've done is is i've made the these visual changes that are occurring in in these dynamic pieces um very very subtle and slow so that the 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 changes in the scene are hardly perceptible in fact and um there's there's some changes uh for example here you probably see there's a kind of faded area there um which is starting to come more into focus now um whether it's over in 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 this one it's 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 very clearly visible um and um the so the identity so she the, she's still um she's still in there and um she's still kind of looking out at us but she's really been kind of consumed by this environment that she's in um and the uh the it, i think it's very hard for for a viewer looking at these to be able to tell what's changed in the image com compared to where they started so you you can you can kind of view one of these images and um visually it looks a certain way at, at the beginning and then you'll notice some changes that happen through over time um and yet uh there are other changes that that really that will go unnoticed it's um i mean i've tried it myself and it's even having two of them next to each other it's uh which is a bit like a kind of spot the difference i suppose um there, it's sometimes very hard to tell and there, there are a lot of gray areas i think in these images as well which are changing themselves um and um so so in this series uh which was which was exhibited um uh through uh Anna, annika mayer's great um digital art curator uh based in berlin um she curate created these in in uh, a couple of exhibitions which are in in new york and, and london uh simultaneously um the the uh with these pieces i think um there's there's a sort of it's it's about the character and it's about how our identities change and digital identities are in flux but it's also about memory as well and and um the the kind of the, the 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 difficulty of that um in our relationship uh with with technology and you know the ever changing sort of uh, uh ever changing landscape of it i suppose um okay so yeah, that's that's my 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 series that's just switching back now 
that's very interesting james thanks a lot um Thank you. I, I, uh yeah very good i don't know whether anybody wants to do a maybe one question now and then we'll have a general discussion at the end so if anybody's got like a quick question before we move on to johnny and then ju ju just so if you have anything specific about this um what james was talking about and then later on after johnny we'll have a, a debate maybe about you know the nature of ai and the terminology even that seems to be a hot topic so has anybody got a question for james before we move on Bruno? Yes, I have. Uh, James, have you heard of a deterministic chaos? It's a branch of mathematics formulated by Henri Poincaré in 19th century. No, but I'm very, I'm very interested to, to hear more about that. It sounds very interesting. Okay, okay we'll go back uh, to that uh, during the general discussion, because Thank that's you. what we've been doing, basically. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, history repeats. <laughs> so great. Okay. Um, the only thing I'd quickly say is um, some of your other work, like gold and the other ones, are more kind of working on the network all the time, aren't they? So they ch change more quickly and there's less sort of mystery, less of the, the personality being changed, uh, you know, the visual personality changing. It's more abstract. So, um, yeah, may maybe if people explore James's work, you'll see all the other um, more recent um, networked kind of art dynamic art pieces which are, i just shared a, a link in the chat actually of yeah, um, I saw Johnny, james's yeah, nfts yeah. so it gives a good overview of everything that's sort of that he's been producing yeah. the last few years really good Great. stuff yeah. i was actually one of the uh, uh, one of the big collectors of your work early on i think james you were. Actually, you i were owned uh, quite a lot of your works um, you still have a pfp i noticed i noticed mm -hmm. yeah i had a look yesterday <laughs> yeah so it's, it's really interesting to, to sort of reconnect on this in this forum and James, if you apply um, your transformations enough times, eventually you will go back to the original image. It's yes, it's, <laughs> That's so it's possible. It's possible. No, no, it's deterministic <laughs> as per point carré. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So, well, we'll leave some of these uh, questions for the final uh, debate. But yeah, Johnny, now it's your uh, your turn. So, if you want to take over for a while. Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and obviously James as well. Um, as I said, I've been following James for a long time now, as well as uh, everything really that's sort of been happening <clears throat> as as part of the digital art scene, which is is been sort of predominantly or or most uh, notably um, part of the NFT space. Um, I started a magazine called the Tickle uh in 2021 which is uh fairly recent but seems like quite a long time ago in, in terms of uh how much has changed both within uh digital art the nft space technology in general and obviously uh ai as well um i will share the links to all these things later but i'll just share my screen just to just to just briefly show you a quick overview of the tickle before i go on to the slow god stuff uh, just bear with me while i share that uh, just yeah, the tickle is very good. I, I should say that Catherine Mason, who's one of the Computer Art Society people, uh, writes for the tickle. Absolutely. So uh, I, I sort of remit oh. essentially initially was to kind of try and promote the stories of the artists uh, within the scene. Essentially, you know, is it? It's a it's a space that was dominated by uh, quick fire kind of social media apps like Twitter and Instagram and such, and there wasn't really a discussion really of in depth of of the artist stories. So we just tried to uh, create an initially a small zine, a sort of pamphlet essentially, um, but which then grew into what it is now, which is like a sort of, you know, fairly in-depth, um, you know, 100 page monthly magazine. Um, so yeah, part of the remit was the stories of the artist. Um, and part of the remit was to, to kind of highlight and promote creative writing as an, as an integral part of digital art which people might not associate with it as such but it's something obviously as a writer that I'm very interested in and that I could see um, was being expressed in various different ways um, within the space so I thought from issue one it would be really important to push creative writing we've had creative writing in uh, basically every issue since uh, including the very first issue uh, and third uh, as you just mentioned Catherine Mason who's um who's associated with the Computer Art Society, 
uh, is a regular columnist for the magazine to to highlight the um, the sort of vignettes essentially from the history of computer art. Uh, I felt that initially within the NFT space, and I think James would probably concur with this. So there's a sort of a broad kind of um, ignorance is a harsh word, but sort of a lack of understanding of the context, the historical context of digital art, of contemporary digital art within uh, the NFT space, particularly. Um, I, there was no real sort of recognition and understanding of the history uh, as much as I felt was necessary, really. So we, beginning about a year ago, we, we employed Catherine to kind of give a, a sort of regular perspective on the history of computer art and to try and tie it in with, you know, the pioneers that over the last uh, 100 years or so, really, or maybe that's a little bit of a stretch, but certainly within 60, 70 years, there's been a lot going on that maybe people aren't really aware of. And Catherine's job is partly to unearth that kind of stuff and, and we're helping to push it as much as possible. Uh, this is the tickle. This is uh, all of our issues on our website, all freely available. Uh, we do sell the magazine, but it's it's um, you can read it and and uh, peruse it for free at your leisure, uh, all the way back to uh, issue one here. When it was called something different, by the way. <laughs> Don't ask me about the title. Uh, so, personally speaking, then, um, oh, can you still see that? Uh, yeah. Is the screen still showing? Yeah, okay, good. Can see my tabs. Um, so, I'm a writer and an artist. I I was exposed kind of quite early on, I guess, through speaking to certain people for the magazine, uh, namely Sasha Styles, um, who is part of the Verseverse, uh, the collective that I was that I was part of as well. Um, we published several of her poems along with Anna, Anna Maria Caballero and and other other writers, Christian Burke, for example, who is um who's a, a notable writer who's been involved with technology. Um and so I got kind of interested in that. I was primarily a digital artist initially in terms of visual work, um, but I've always been a writer and this, the poetry aspect and the AI aspect kind of really appealed to me. Um, but I, I guess in terms of the, the projects that I've been making, I, I certainly wouldn't consider myself any kind of an expert or a pioneer in AI. I'm much more of a consumer. Um, I'm not playing around with like James is doing with complicated stuff with neural networks and and really deep diving into the actual tech itself. I'm much more of a sort of uh, an interested um, observer, I would say. So I I got talking to um, a writer called James Yu, um, who's a sort of a poet, uh, a fiction writer, but always dabbles with technology. And he created a tool called Pseudo Write, um, of which uh, is is part of this creative process for this new project uh, of mine, which I started about maybe 18 months ago called Slow Gods. Uh, Slow Gods is here. Uh, let me just zoom in on that a little bit. There we go. I'm just going to refresh the page because uh, the timings of them is quite satisfying. Here we go. So Slow Gods is a kind of long series of uh, poems. Um, it's kind of a long form project, I guess, um, of uh, I've put AI human collaborative uh, illuminated poems. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, we spoke about the nature of this, the word collaboration itself yesterday and how kind of um, uh, sort of unreliable it is. I, I, I call it a collaboration, but uh, I, I guess it's me kind of manipulating AI tools, I guess. Um, the initial point of influence, of influence was uh, illuminated manuscripts. I'm really fascinated with the history of these things, uh, the, the, the Book of Kells or the, the Lindisfarne Gospels, for example, um, where sort of teams of uh, teams of people spent thousands and thousands of hours um, detailed, doing detailed uh, illustrations and metalwork and uh, painting and arranging of uh, images around text, uh, Bible texts. Um, the actual formation of this project is, uh, so each poem is an aphorism um, from Nietzsche. I've always been interested in the kind of, the density of poetic language and also that kind of 
the the point in history where the sort of predominant method of um of literature was 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 transitioning from poetry to kind of novels to prose um and those the density of language in those early novellas and and sort of short novels has always been really interesting to me and so uh, the the density of information in in an aphorism um really appealed to me the pseudo right um sort of conditions for use it needs one of them is that it needs 15 words minimum in order to help you out with your writing it's essentially a writer's tool to for, for a writer's block essentially if you're writing a novel you can type in some of the chapter and then it sort of attempts to write a little bit more for you along with other um other tools um but the 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 limit for pseudo I was 15 words uh, and all of the sort of aphorisms that I was sourcing uh, mainly from human to human um, were very short and so it was kind of stressing the the AI tools essentially uh, we spoke yesterday a little bit uh, with Patrick about how the the sort of earlier AI models in mid-journey and Dali and such were were almost more aesthetically pleasing and interesting as it is a visual um, artifact because they weren't very good uh, because they sort of struggle a little bit and were a little bit eccentric uh, you got exactly the same thing with uh, chat gpt2 for example it created some kind of crazy stuff but it was interesting in its eccentricity and craziness whereas the more polished mid-journey uh, visual ai tools are, are so good nowadays that they, they kind of not that interesting um, I was also using, uh, reading a, an article by uh, Rob Horning recently about the uh, about this uh, idea of model collapse, where um, it's a theoretical situation in which um, the internet becomes so flooded with AI created material that then AIs feed on that, and then eventually it kind of devolves into a sort of inbreeding kind of situation. Uh, he described it as a kind of mad cow disease for machines. Um, so. In all of the the sort of way I use AI tools, I try to stress them as much as possible. Um, I'll show you my pseudo right screen. Uh, so this is the uh, original aphorism. Pseudo right has a bunch of tools. Uh, I usually use the one called rewrite. Uh, on the side of the screen here, you can see some examples of the way I've used this. Uh, I'll just give you a very quick example of this. So you can rewrite this uh, and then you can rephrase it, for example, to in various different ways, shorter, more descriptive, show, not tell. Uh, I'll just choose more intense as an example here. Um, and then click go. And in a few seconds, it will, it will notch up various different examples of what it thinks is a more intense version of that little bit of text that you've given it. Um, most of this is generally quite bad writing, but if you do it enough, it creates some interesting kind of formulations of language that I find really interesting as a creative writer. So I took as many of those as possible and kind of tried to rewrite it. The, the output of the aphorism through the air tool as an actual human made poem. Uh, and so you can see via the various iterations here, uh, me essentially processing this kind of forced information from the AI tool uh, into a kind of finished poem. At that point, I use a tool uh, called, well, I used to use a tool called Midjourney, and then I figured out how to do um, an instance on my own PC of Stable Diffusion, which is cheaper and, and a lot more flexible. Um, but I put the, uh, the, I can't remember the exact terminology for it, but the slider for the amount of uh, iterations it goes through uh, right down to the bottom. I think it goes up to 150 and I put it down to like five or six or something. And then I feed it a line of the poem one at a time uh, to see what it can come up with. And then that essentially is the illumination of the poem. Um, so it creates a sort of illustration uh, line by line, essentially, of the poem itself. And so that kind of iteration goes back and forth. I go through thousands and thousands of images and finally arrive at a point where I've got um, a set of images which accompany each line of the poem. Uh, you can see here um, this one, for example, it 
the line partially of overworn concrete created this kind of um industrial what is like a silo or something in in a kind of wheat field i guess uh just one of the random eccentricities of the of the model when you don't give it much information to work with uh and then i kind of followed that theme um and tried to force it to keep that kind of visual scenario throughout the poem as much as you possibly can because it's impossible to to get that exactly right every time and then follow that all the way through to the end uh, the result is uh let me find the page there it is uh, refresh the page so it goes to the first frame and you can see it uh, run through i won't run through it all because it takes a long time um these are gifs which are normally very quick meme type images uh, from the internet um, but what I've deliberately done is is drastically slowed that down. So uh, each frame takes a, a, a number of seconds. And so the entire GIF experience uh, is, is minutes long instead of a few seconds. Um, I could talk uh, a lot longer about this than, than, I, than I have done, but I will, I'll bring it to a close here. I will stop sharing my screen after a few frames of this and actually just read it out to you. And then, I, and then I'll be done. But yeah, I'll send some links where you can look at all of these. Uh, there's currently 13, um, and it's a series of 50, so there's a long way to go. And it will eventually kind of mutate and transform. The length that it takes to create this whole series is interesting in, in a sense as well, because the tools I'm using are constantly updating. I'm changing tools all the time and changing the way I use them. Um, so from slow gods number one to slow gods, Number 50, there should be some notable uh, arc of kind of um, uh, in terms of narrative, in terms of visuals and, and the way it's presented. Uh, but yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen now. And I will read you uh, the poem Slow Gods and number 12. Um, this is one of the longer ones, but it's still fairly short, so it wouldn't take me too long. Okay, um, Slow Gods, number 12. Error has a skimmed scent, partially of overworn concrete, turning of earth and ephemeral. It computes as numbers do from underworn conceits or not yet worn as needs be. It unearths not a stone set truth, but a swarm of wrong made of the opposite of stone. As a moat of ash in wind burned streets combines with all other dust to the power of brute or as the crowd that collates might of intellect to imbue the enchanting speaker who stands on mount in absolute view with sound and rightness with enchant itself with eyes of blue ash or otherwise the motes fit their unborn power pops out as a digit just a digit so from old concrete and digits we form power and meaning that resonates and is alive. Rejoice, rejoice, are we not right? But at the end of our tethered day, our only nuclear feat was a puff of steam. Perhaps we should make worlds with atmospheres of skimmed scent, both beneath and above contempt. And while we speak, a gate opens up and lets through a truth incoherently noticed but entirely felt and that's me done well thank you johnny that was great that was a really interesting poem so uh, now um i'd like to ask you a question actually how much of that poem you, you said you were processing it with pseudo write and then and then rewriting so i mean this is a pretty sort of basic thing to ask but uh, how much was you and how much was the tool? It's an interesting question, actually. Let me, I could just show you very briefly just a little bit more detail of that, if you, if you like. Um, yeah, because in, when this um, the AI Writers Anthology came out a year ago and people were using the tools and sending in stories and poems, and there was a big questionnaire with it for everybody in the book. Phil, Phil, this One of the questions was, you know, how much is you and how much is the machine and how did how did you feel about that and uh what's your authorial content there and how about ownership and all these sort of sort of general research questions i was interested in and i ran them by a load of professional writers in another piece of research and you know it's you get it's really interesting 
everybody has a different take on how they use these tools. So I'm just interested in how you thought about it. Yeah, I, I guess it's it's hard to avoid that sort of question of ego, isn't it? Like, you know, if, if you're putting something out into the world um, for people to digest, to read, to share, it's you feel a certain responsibility to to have been the author of it in, in some mm -hmm. way. Uh, it depends on the nature of the project, obviously, and your sort of conceptual, um, you know, reasoning. But uh, for me, I, I felt it was important to to just to to borrow the title of the magazine just to tickle tickle the algorithms a little bit just to sort of brush them and see what they could produce and then take what they produced uh and then create something from it so i, I guess it's hard to say i'd say probably 70 to 80 percent is mine but it's all sourced sure, from, sure. from the ai um and the, i find it really fascinating uh, some of the examples are really just super bad that the that the pseudo right brings up for you um but you can tweak it a little bit if you like uh, let me just very briefly show you um i know we don't have a maximum amount of time but let me just very briefly uh so one of the first um rewrites of this line was this one that i, I thought was nice uh, there's lots of different rewrites on the side that i go through um, but i put the ones into the actual main window here that i quite like uh, so this is the first rewrite of this. The antithesis is a slimy conduit through which treachery slithers to try and infiltrate truth. Its slimy coils squeeze together as it wriggles through, threatening to poison truth with its malevolent intent. Um, it's kind of bad, um, but there's a certain tone to it that I quite liked, and so I kind of iterated and iterated on that to kind of pick out little things. Um, and there's this sort of this sensory kind of effects there, this slime and the slithering and the, and wriggling and poison and and there's so that there's this sort of notion of like a scent really came through um, and that sort of stayed with me right until the final final lines here. So error has a skimmed scent is something that I directly kind of took inspiration from, uh, but the the AI didn't actually create itself. So. Um, each one is very different as well. It depends on what the AI comes up with and what I'm inspired to write. So yeah, it's 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 a really fun process, actually. It's a really exciting one. It's kind of like, I, I don't like the word collaboration, but it's um, it does feel like you're bouncing ideas off another writer in a creative writing class, for example. Or, mm, no, I agree. Like... Yeah, I've done a few uh, written things, which are in the book, actually, in the, in the early part of the book. It's a a poem the sea is the answer now the sea is the answer is just a phrase but it's quite a strong phrase in itself i mean what does it mean what's the question but you know it's a it's a strong start to, and then then it churned out all this stuff from gpt2 which I, I think it was gpt2 um so it's a bit more random like you said a bit more eccentric uh, and then obviously it gets you have to edit it all together into some piece at the end from uh, reams and reams of the classic ai or whatever you want to call it uh, overproduction which is an issue but I think with overproduction for an artist that can be quite stimulating and quite quite a useful thing and then you kind of gather what you want from this pile so I think there's different ways of working with it definitely compared to normal I mean, I've done quite a bit of normal writing if you like and um, it's a very different process you know this it's kind of liberating in some ways to have this companion you know helping you out a bit or it's inspiring you in some way uh, okay, so um, any questions for Johnny before we take it a bit further uh, on yeah. an open discussion? Yeah, sorry. I, I actually have to go in, in a couple of minutes because I've got to put my daughter to bed. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I, I, I'm sort of, yeah. It's okay. Mine's on the way home on a bus. I've just been texting her, so she's a bit older. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Just I'll letting you know anyway. But, 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 but um, you know. Have you got a quick, quick, quick question before you go, maybe? Uh, for for Johnny, yeah. Um, oh, I don't know. I don't have a question. It was really interesting to see the process after having having read it. Um, I, I your reading of it. Um, no, it was really interesting. I really I really enjoyed it um, a lot. Uh, very very interesting. And yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where you kind of want to know the whole process. You want to know, okay, well, exactly, you know, yeah. which parts came from where. Um, no, it's great. Excellent. Okay. Bye, James.
Yeah, thanks. I'm gonna I'm gonna head off. Thanks everyone. Yeah, the video should be up quite soon, so you'll be able to catch the rest of it. Cheers, Jack. We hope. Okay, bye. Okay, so um well, Bruno, you didn't get the chance to discuss with James about your mathematical uh interests. But uh okay, so any questions for uh Johnny or anybody who wants to, you know, maybe maybe chat to Johnny for a bit and then move into a discussion of um AI as a tool for an artist. So has anybody got a question? Bruno? No particular questions, just remarks. Um okay. going back to deterministic chaos. Why it's deterministic is because the surface on which you've done your work is fin finite. There's only so many points, any point can actually occupy. And this is why, according to uh, Poincaré's uh, deterministic chaos theory, if you apply transformations enough times, you will go back to your original mm. uh, drawing. But is that because it will be the... a phase? It will be a phase through which it is it uh, it has to pass through, because again, your surface is finite. But it's very large. It might not be. It may be large, point. but it's still finite. But then the, um, I suppose in time the computer power would become bigger and faster. So maybe the whole process would speed up exponentially as years go by, and then in, in ten years you'd get the original. Five minutes, according to uh, quantum computers and IBM and Google. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But this minutes, thing yeah. about infinite infinity as a number means that everything is happening everywhere. You know, by de by definition, really. But so if it's not if it's not actually an infinite system, then it would repeat in the way you mentioned. Yeah, and it is so, a finite system. We don't have infinite. As soon as you get into the infinite, you get into trouble. I know. Actually. Yeah. Well, I don't know, but one reads and ponders these things sometimes okay but yeah that um so maybe that, that's an aspect of ai art use then that you have this system that is appearing to produce an unlimited amount of new stuff you know it isn't because obviously it's kind of collaging things really basically uh, like, what i haven't heard yesterday and i've heard, I've heard about chomsky and uh, we know mm -hmm. that chomsky deeper layers roots of language went absolutely nowhere but what I haven't heard is metaphor and metonymy. And these are two Freudian concepts. Mm. Dreams happen through metaphor and metonymy. And metonymy and metaphor is what we are actually doing all the time, most especially in poetry. That's the one thing. Mm. Uh, I haven't heard anything about William Burroughs' technique of a cut-up. Mm. Has anyone tried to do cut-ups in ChatGPT? Uh, well, you could print it out and physically cut it up. But if you asked it to mimic a cut-up, it would have a go at it. So that would work. Okay. But in in I... some way, I mean, I, I've you know played around with some of these things, but I find working with AI and text is that it's a, a new thing. It's a different thing rather than it's just coming. Because you certainly in the older versions, as Johnny was saying, like a few years ago, uh, I mean, I started with writing my own neural nets and then loading my own writing into them and you know, training them on my own stuff. And that was really interesting. And then it's just changed so rapidly now that it's possible now to just put in a big um, chunk of your own text and just tell it to use that style. And in, in the old days, people would say, oh, yeah, we have a co computer writing Shakespeare sonnets. And isn't that incredible? Or, you know, Mozart or something. And this was a few, maybe 10 years ago or whatever less than but you know this was amazing and now of course it just do that uh before you finish typing it will have typed back it, the reply okay it's what okay. hannah arendt called the comfort of servitude you don't need to think anymore you delegate well, there, it yeah, all yeah, there is, yeah no i get <laughs> to that too. yeah it's almost like become a pastime or a, a hobby or something that exactly. you do as a sideline and but, um, there's a quote sorry there's a quote by from uh, baudrillard Concerning AI, actually, uh, I'm translating trans the translation in English is mine. The sadness of artificial intelligence is that it is without artifice, it is without tricks, mm. and therefore it is without intelligence. 
and that's Bodria in a book of his called Cool Memories. Okay, that's that, interesting. Yes, that's very, very interesting. Um, AI does not have an unconscious. Well, it's a, it's a mimicry, mimicking, isn't it? So if it's mimicking, it can mimic all those things. Like there was a recent test where they, I think they tried to get one of the GPTs to sort of become a cheat. So it was asked to, you know, log, uh, log into an AI system, log into a system and then uh, pretend to be somebody it wasn't. And the first thing it had to do was fill up something with a capture, with a kind of visual capture. And uh, I think it got around it by pretending to be a blind person approaching it. And then it got ass got assistance or something. And it managed to trick its way th through a barrier. And that, you, you might imagine that's artificial general intelligence because it's thinking around a problem and finding a novel solution. Or maybe it's just mimicking all of the vast amount of training data that it includes people. So it's mimicking, it's, and, if it's mimicking, mimicking all it's of it. mimicking us. So yeah, exactly. It's, because, exactly. So yeah. it's a comfort of servitude, Anna Harant. Mm -hmm. We delegate all the hard stuff to some machine. Take uh, the beginning of a poem by Rimbaud, for instance. Je est un autre. I is an other. Hmm. Right. How do you get chat GPT to, uh, to produce that? But uh, ha has anyone seen uh, Mallarmé, 19th century French poet, poem called A Throw of Dice? It's not hmm. just the poetry itself. It's the layout on the page. Look at it. Look yeah, at I will. It. Well, that's yeah. interesting because there's a et, et voilà et voilà and it's human and it's metaphor and metonymy without yeah, it you can't have that. you can't have poetry yeah yeah there is and... a concrete poetry uh oh it's just been put off actually for a year but anyway okay next year there's a concrete poetry <laughs> yeah, talk next year. <laughs> okay. Baran. sorry it was till an hour ago it was in yeah. april but no it's a year who uh, remembers mm -hmm. the surrealistic technique of uh poetry called uh the exquisite corpse yeah sure yeah uh, ah okay yeah Not, these and, are, well uh, i used to do a lot of that with my kids you know you yeah. you'd want to entertain them with these sort of drawings or you can do it with text obviously as well but do, um is anybody else want to join in the discussion at this point and oh, one la one one last thing uh, oh, i'd like to mention out a bit. would chat gpt work with click languages Oh, you mean like exosa or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's interesting. It's all yeah. oral, oral, but they can do a text to speech. So presumably, you could just train it to do all that. So yeah, probably. I'm sure people are looking at that. You know, I think it'd probably do that fairly easily, easily, wouldn't it? Sorry. Uh, one thing. Uh, one thing, Jeff. I just wanted to just mention. I guess since uh, you know Bruno is on about mimicking, and and that's you know it's basically essentially what's happening. But what what I find quite interesting about the the way that these models actually work through internally is this notion of the latent space it's it's a kind of um it's kind of a mystery in a, in a lot of ways and I, and one of the questions i ask a lot of the ai artists that we interview for the magazine is is what do you conceive of as this latent space what is what is it exactly what is it doing and um, what is being represented within that kind of framework and even you know uh well, sort of how many dimensions are involved in this thing you know it's 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 quite a it's mm. quite a sort of nebulous strange um unknowable area of the systems and i think that the people who code these algorithms aren't necessarily 100 percent cognizant about exactly what's going on in them either and i think i just find that that sort of idea of this mysterious cloud that just happens in the middle of the process quite an interesting one quite almost quite a poetic one you know i wondered what um, anyone thought about this this concept? I, I, I saw a video on that Sora video, uh, OpenAI technology, and um, the the guy who was explaining it was a PhD uh, in sort of you know graphics and in in um, uh, AI sort of technologies was just like oh it just happens in the latent space, no, no real kind of explanation of the, what that is, mm. and it's I just thought that was really interesting. Like no one really knows. It's this kind of. It's almost. I think that if we're ever going to get to AGI, which which maybe we will, uh, it will be something related to this. Well, I assume it's some enormous statistical space that is using maths that you humans can't really understand or relate to. 
and then it's selecting uh, best options to, to complete things really. And I think the patches they use in Sora is using a similar approach of tokens where things are broken down into little tiny parts. And then there's no sort of overall plan. It just evolves itself in the space. Yeah, that's, what, that's where it comes from. But it comes up with something that is accurate and lo looks like an image or reads like normal text. And it is really interesting. And of course, there's no memory in these systems. They're not, the systems aren't aware of what they're doing and they're not conscious of what they're doing. It's to, no matter how realistic they are, even to a superior level of realism, like a multiple level of re uh, realism or an enlarged, set, uh, expanded even uh, reality that they use, they're still not conscious. They're still just a machine. Uh, and that's the interesting thing, that it's like there won't be a Terminator robot going around being angry, shooting at us. It would just be some other system working that we don't understand. And this is one of the more, you know, the sort of existential fear is that we'll have a partner that is superior just because it's thinking much much quicker than we are and of course you know the original neural net was a perceptron i think it was designed in 1943 and first built in the 50s i think or in the late 40s um and that was modeled on a neural a very small neural system and even that was a bit of a mystery how it worked for Im image analysis and then it's just grown I mean, that's a long time ago. So if you think of the developments and then there was a detour into expert systems, which didn't really work, the sort of manual way of doing it, trying to code everything to make yeah, that's it. Sort of again. That's, where, it? that's where the old fashioned language and translation didn't work because it was impossible to have enough rules to keep it all, all kind of going along. Whereas the AI will just do it in, in this mysterious space by comparing things. Yeah. So it, and it, even, it, it, oh, it, sorry, Jim. No, I'm just saying it's it's a very interesting. And of course, what Bruno is talking about is applying concepts from the human world into this artificial world, which is interesting. That latent space in mm -hmm. psychoanalysis is called the other with a capital O. Sure because, sure. because nobody knows where languages come from. Nobody knows how babies learn language. Yeah. Are, ca yeah, are sure. capable of language and so on. And it's but language the is other... an evolved thing from you, you know other animals. So obviously, it... animals an, animal, animals don't have the uh, physiology for articulation of differential phonemes, which is what our language consists of. Mm. They don't have that. Mm -hmm. But so they're, they they're for... definitely still communicating a lot of information between each other. Anthropomorphism. Careful with that. Now you, that's. Descartian, surely you're saying that there's like humans and then everything else, but I think there's, there's, there there is an intention. Yeah. There is intention in animals. Yes, uh, I'll agree with that. And they do communicate quite. I mean, and plan together and work together and do all sorts of things that are very human. I mean, human like we imagine they're human, but actually they're sort of generic to animals. As a, as a musicologist and as a musician, as a composer, um, sometimes I hear a tune in my dreams. Okay. And I wake up. Quickly, 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 I write it down. Bang. And I've got, that's my AI. Okay. <laughs> my yeah, AI sure, is my, it, it's my, it's myself. That's interesting because um, somebody at a talk I went to at UAL last year was saying that he thought that uh, the whole neural net idea for uh, computer AI systems is actually is modeled on the brain originally back in the perceptron. And that's where it's all developed from. So, that is kind of how the mind, you know, you have inspiration. You don't know where it comes from. It just pops out into your writing. People say, oh, yes, I was inspired and wrote the novel in a week, you know, all that. So and nobody, when they write, knows what the next word's going to be because you're writing, you're, you're in a flow. You know, you're not in control of it. You're not mechanically putting the words out. So this is where the, the burrows and the cut-ups and all that is a way of interrupting that flow and maybe bringing in things that you wouldn't naturally flow with. And that's a stimulation to your writing, obviously. And the AI, I, yes, is a part of that whole. And I do a lot, uh, a lot of improvisation. I've got my own piano at home and I do a lot of improvisation. And from mm. one note to the next, I am not aware of what the next rhythm, yeah. the next pitch is going to be. But I yeah. trust, basically, I trust my own training. Yes. Yeah, and exactly. my own imagination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rimbaud did not have an AI at his disposal, nor Verlaine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's the one thing. No, there's definitely a history. I mean, the the book I have just uh, sorted out as a timeline in it of 
for this kind of language and technology and so on. So yeah, very interesting. I should mention that me and Bruno go back quite a long way from micro arts in the eighties. So. Micro arts in the eighties. Yes. And um, network twenty one and all these exciting things we used to get up to. So. Which we wrote about in the article uh, in the last issue, didn't we? Yeah, that's right. So you, know, you should have a look, Bruno. It's online. So cool. Issue ninety. There's my little. Uh... Is it ninety? Oh, are you planning anything <laughs> special for the hundredth one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the hundred is the big one. That'd be Christmas, wouldn't it? It'd be like end of the year. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, oh, don't plan ahead that far. <laughs> and so again, uh, remember, for creation, we only have three tools: metaphor, metonymy, and transposition. Well, mm -hmm. that's okay. it. Yeah, we should apply those to our AI systems and see what comes out. Well, I've got my own AI there. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Is anybody else um, wanting to contribute to our discussion out there? Paul, maybe? Not sure who's there now. OK. So any more questions? Oh, we have Paul. Ah, Paul. Hello, Paul. Hi there. Hi, Paul. Is it like, um, hang on, I'm trying to think, well, you're 12 hours different over there, isn't it? It's uh, 11 hours right now, so uh, it's just approaching 10 past 7 in the morning on Friday. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, okay. Cool. Well, thanks for coming at such an early hour. Well, thanks for uh, uh, thanks to all of you and the, the speakers yesterday for uh, a fascinating session. And I'm looking forward, I think Sean's intending to edit the two sequences together. Yeah. And putting it on the uh, the CAS um, uh, video channel on YouTube fairly soon. So I'll yeah, look forward right. to seeing that when it's all been put together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were here yesterday, though, weren't you? I think. Yeah. 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 So you had the sudden sudden ending of it. That's right. Your yeah. Experience yeah. along with all of us. Maybe that's the metaphor for something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yeah, have you got a question for anyone, Paul? Maybe John? No, I found it all fascinating, but uh, I, I don't have a question. Okay, okay. Great. Um, questions? Yes. Uh, you were planning any new works, Johnny, in that line of uh, sort of... So I, I do regard that as kind of text art as a genre, if you like, whether it's animated or not animated or on the blockchain or not on the blockchain. So do you envisage doing any new work in that line? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm continuing the slow gods. That's a slow, <laughs> appropriately uh, project. Um, I, I anticipate doing that for another another year, I guess, maybe okay. minimum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got a separate project um, writing about uh, dementia in a poetry series, um, which is uh, ongoing and should be releasing at some point in the next few months. Um, okay, good. Yeah, lots of lots of lots of projects on the go, plus the magazine. Mm, and the, mm. the the inconvenience of a of a full time job as well. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. It's very <laughs> too, too many things at the moment. Definitely, mm. it's very well inherited. Yeah. Has yeah. anyone has anyone used the matrix mathematics for their transformations? No, you see, with the tool, modern tools, you don't really need to know anything. It's a sort of consumer level now. I mean, a few only a few short years ago, you had to kind of hand build everything. Then some of the Things like GPT came out and rapidly improved, and then people built front ends on those. So you had a, a user interface. You just you know put the words in, tweak the temperature or whatever. Very, very sort of easy, easy to understand sort of terms for the for the controls. And then now they've become everybody uses them. I mean, I it, with Chat GPT when that came out, which is only was that not that long ago at all, and it wasn't even advertised. It just suddenly became super popular. Like nobody mm -hmm. had to be persuaded or advertised that to use it. it. Just like Facebook or something, it just suddenly became very popular because it had such a lot of utility in it because you didn't have to think about it too much. You just, you need some copy for your report. You just ask it to write something for you, you know. So they became ubiquitous almost overnight. And then certainly with the text to art as well, it went from being like really crude a few years ago and people mm -hmm. would make art showing how fuzzy it all was and that sort of thing to um this sort of like photorealistic stuff that's just incredible 
Uh, so yeah, it's, sort of, the... it's a really odd period now where it's changing so quickly. Like with this Sora thing, it's just HD widescreen text to video. I and mean, what does that mean? I could put a, one of my stories in like paragraph by paragraph and just get endless scenes of a movie out of it, presumably. One thing that was... Like one thing that was interesting about that, I, I'm sorry, Jeff, for interrupting. I keep doing that. That's Apologies. That's um, the, the, uh, they showed some examples of various um, iterations of Sora with different uh, amounts of compute power, which I, I found really interesting. They had um, uh, four times compute power, and it was just this garbled mess, like it came out of uh, the first iteration of uh, text to image. Um, it was quite nightmarish actually. And then they doubled that and then it kind of got a little bit better. And then it had to go all the way up to like, you know, I don't know, 20 times GPU compute power in order to get something that was actually decent. So that kind of, mm. you know, having been involved in NFTs for a while where they had set a lot of bad press for their environmental impact. And there's a lot of talk about how much server and GPU, because it's all done on GPUs, which are very power intensive. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk about how destructive that is for the environment. Loads of people using ChatGPT, for example, and all the other AI tools. Um, no, totally, this, yeah. I this, mean, that, that topic of... seemed to disappear a bit. Remember, there yeah, was, but um, I think it's going to come back for sure. No, no, it's I... the thing about like how bad NFTs are, and that went viral, and everybody was talking about how terrible it was. Yeah. Exactly. And then that yeah. got just dropped completely, and now nobody gives a damn. Apparently, well, they've they've transformed but... it basically now to to a non uh, environmentally damaging one, but it took a long time. Um, well, but theory, yes, yeah, but I mean, just generally, it's uh, all technology uses a huge amount of energy. I mean, yeah. that's unavoidable. But as it becomes pervasive, so everything you do is using cloud power, and you know, it's called cloud. You know, yeah, it's up in the heavens. Who cares? But it's just it's huge, mm. so huge server farms. You know, very hot buildings, world. basically. Exactly. It's, it's not in a cloud at all. It's very hot buildings. Exactly. Uh, and yet Sora takes such an extraordinary amount of power just to make one video. It's almost going back mm -hmm. to the bad days of NFTs. So right. I think that's probably why it's not a public release yet, because they know it it sucks up a whole load of power. And that's money to them as well, I guess. So uh, it's be interesting to see how it develops. Yeah, it could just be a pay for service, you know, only fairly expensive. So you pay mm -hmm. for your GPU, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And you know, just the sort of you're talking just then about the sort of the consumer level nature of these AI tools, and a lot of them are, of course, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can speak with personal experience about how difficult it was to set up a stable diffusion instance on my desktop PC. It's uh, pretty difficult. Python yeah. coding and all this kind of nonsense. So uh, that was that was pretty tricky. But Yeah, sure. Well done. Congratulations. Would, uh, would James Joyce, would he have, James Joyce, would he have used ChatGPT to write Finnegan's Wake? <laughs> we could write another one quite quickly, but um, part two. <laughs> but the um, other thing is, of course, that loads of professional writers use this stuff. They just won't say it because they won't, they get a kind of a tag as a computer writer or something, and then they've had it. So you have to maintain your artistic sort of uniqueness. And obviously, you'll be on these tools. You don't need them. But I bet all of them are using it. I mean, Hanif Qureshi did an article about this area recently, and then his son wrote something about script writing using them. And that's quite an interesting read. And he's one of the about the only one that sort of popped up and talked about it, really. Because Joyce uh, wrote Finnegan's Wake by collecting over a period of 10 years what he heard in various circumstances. Mm -hmm. And he just take a note, put it on paper, and then put that all together. Yes, yes. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you know Tony White? No. Oh, he's a, he's a London writer, but he did a talk with Paul Brown uh, a few months ago on on what was it um you finnegan's day is it or ulysses bloom's day the, yes. the, whole, the whole thing it was at a university paul gave a talk with some you know some video and then tony did a a lot of poems and things but he did a reading from finnegan's wake sort of from memory and did a whole piece around uh, it. And, and there's a further layer to a uh, choice writing he wrote in a way that the english uh yes the english occupier would not understand Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, he yeah. was basically he was hiding uh, what he was writing, yeah. mm -hmm. and that's a dimension which can only be human, in mm -hmm. a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. Yeah, Joyce is yeah, but these these um, modernist writers are still very popular now, you know, along with all the Dickens and all the rest of it, you know. But yeah, oh, good. Okay, okay, we um we're sort of getting on with time. What time is it now? I don't even know. Hang on. 
it's 2018 oh, sorry, 20... on my on my yeah British 2018 computer. okay yeah i'm on a different computer now but so maybe we should um wrap up i think perhaps yeah if nobody's got any more questions but it's great everybody came along uh and it's really interesting i think it would have been you know it would have been good good with anna here maybe to, and and uh, patrick but maybe we'll do that again at some future point you know these might become kind of vaguely annual or something who knows uh it's good to see you bruno I've seen you for a long good time. to see you yeah we must communicate more possibly possibly by email <laughs> okay anyway everybody take care and um thanks for coming and uh i'll wait till everybody's gone and then i'll close the uh event down so thanks everyone